This is the Paul Goff Audio Experience, business lessons for physical therapists. My name is Paul Goff, former professional soccer physical therapist turned successful business owner and best-selling author from the UK. Each week, we answer your questions and bring you an inspiring story or person from the global physical therapy community. This show is dedicated to sharing with you everything you need to know to become hugely successful in private practice. Thanks for joining me today. Now let the class begin. Alison, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. You can hear me, but I can't hear you. So give me one second. Is that better now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah. Okay, great. Leave me with any technical stuff and it always goes wrong. I keep telling them (laughs) type of thing that if you give me anything. Right. I'm just going to make sure we're live on Facebook and I can take some questions. Uh, I got you. There we go. Good, good. So, Alison, welcome. Um, Thank you. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the uh, Quasi podcast live stream on Instagram, live stream on LinkedIn, live stream on YouTube, live stream on Facebook. You are beaming all over the world right now, quite literally. All right. Well, thank you. I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm excited for this interview. Um, I remember our last interview. um, You were the last person I interviewed in public uh, before the world changed back in uh, in March. How long ago does that seem I know. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Two two days later, the world Jake warned me. He he warned me. He said, don't get too personal on this one. I want to know about your (laughs) business. I remember (laughs) remember the last time I interviewed you, I'm sat, I'm gone. Kill this one. Definitely, we, we ain't sharing this one with anybody. And like the whole camera, uh, the whole camera had to get switched off for your interview. So, uh, I'm sure we're gonna have some fun. So, yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, thanks for coming on. You've got a great story to share and to um, inspire. And you're great, but growing up, you're now stepping back from patient care and all of the uh, challenges and the struggles emotionally and just uh, mentally, if you like, that you've got to go through to get to that point. So we'll have um, we'll have some fun for the next uh, 45 minutes or so as well. So obviously we're over in uh, Washington, Seattle area. Tell us exactly, um, tell us about your business right now. Um, I think it's important for people. We're going to go back. We're going to kind of learn a little bit about how you've got it. But try and give people some context on uh, the business now, the revenue, uh, the staff, uh, just the type of premises, your uh, model cash out of network. Just tell us everything that you are right now, and then we'll kind of dig into how you've got to this point uh, so quickly. Yeah. um, Currently, we are located in Edmonds, Washington. So we're north of Seattle by about 20 minutes. And uh, we are an all-cash out-of-network clinic. Mainly, we work with women through their childbearing years, through fertility, pregnancy, and postpartum care. And that is our specialty. So that's the clinic right now. We operate, we have two therapists, me being one, my other yep. therapist, my other um, physical therapist. And then we have a general manager as well. And we just lost our salesperson, but that's okay. That's um, pur- purposely fired the salesperson. And so we are moving on. And so we're back to a staff of three, fluctuating between three and four for the last few months. So. So we've got two full-time PTs, we've got a GM, and we've just moved on a salesperson. Yeah. In the company. All right. So how have we got here? Tell us. Uh, tell us how we got here. What's the What's the journey that you've took, if you like? I know you're on a uh, trajectory that is uh, that is fast and is uh, really accelerated over the last couple of years. Um, tell us what what the initial uh, launching of the clinic looked like, if you like. How did you go from working for somebody to where you are today? Yeah. So I had my son three years ago and four weeks after I started, after I had him, I started a mobile practice. I, I didn't want to go mobile. I wanted to have like a big fancy clinic right away, but I wasn't ready to bite the bullet financially. And I hate loans. So I just, that was the best way to do it. So I started as a mobile practice in the Seattle area. I also had a PR and home health job that I was doing, you know, has as much as I could to supplement all my time I could, you know, do as I'm trying to ha- get my own clients as well. At that point, I signed up for Accelerator. Yeah. And I figured out that I can't be marketing to everybody. I didn't even know what marketing was, to be honest. I was not confident. I didn't know how to present myself. So 
people would say, well, you don't take my insurance, you know, that whole get up. Right. So, so, you, so you literally knew nothing. Like I knew nothing. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. What was so, that like when you first did the accelerator program now, then go back a few years? Was it like drinking from a bloody fire hose a bit? Right. Right. And it's been, you know, extremely beneficial. It made me niche down. So it made me really dive into this women's health thing. And I didn't want to, I really wanted to stay with like athletes and go the hockey route because I'm a hockey player. And so it was, it was hard to do that, but everyone else was doing the sports thing, you know, and that's what everyone else did. So when you've always said like, when everyone's doing one thing, just go the other way. And so I, I decided to do the women's health track and I got, once I really niched down to the birth world and kind of not just women's health, really the birth world and started connecting with people in that realm, that's when the practice, the mobile practice started to take off. Um, I had, even though I had taken accelerator, you know, it's like a slow implementation process. I had developed nice connections with other people and I had a, a primary referral source. Yeah. And that primary referral source after a year of really like feeding my business uh, she decided to close her doors and that was scary because i was like now i better really start doing this paul stuff um i can't remember if i was in mastermind at that point or not um i had decided to open a physical location that was pretty much 20 minutes north of all my patients so it was almost like starting over again in 2018 so i started in fall of two or fall of 2017 and then i opened my physical location fall of 2018 yeah and yeah so here we here are, we are. Mm -hmm. i think uh, there's two good lessons i've uh, written down as you speak there um number one it, it does never amaze me how many people start a business and think that their business is for everybody particularly in healthcare, because the underlying um, bias that we have or reflex is probably the right word. The underlying reflex that you have in healthcare is that you can help everybody. So you think that you can just open these doors, put your name above it and say, hey, come on in, everybody walk through these doors. And to a certain extent, the traditional model PT business could because it was a doctor. They were only ever marketing to a doctor, right? And this is the profound understanding. They were marketing to a doctor and a marketer would send anybody and everybody, which was fine, but it, it doesn't work like that in the realm of direct marketing when you're trying to get particularly cash pay or out of network where you're trying to reach out into the public and grab the audience or the attention of a of a pocket of people that you want to come and, and obviously do business with you. And the second thing that you brought up there that I hope somebody is listening is that the worst number in business is one. And that is that you rely upon any one single thing in a company, you will get hurt. It is a matter of time. It, whether that's the rock star PT or the rock star GM or front desk guy or gal, it is a matter of time before that person either becomes a complete pain in the ass, goes rogue, or is a flight risk, and then you're in trouble. And nearly always it's the doctor that I rely upon a doctor who sends me 80% of my referrals. Dr. Smith wants to sell up and move on. Big corporate clinic comes into town and buys them out and you're in trouble. And that leaves the clinic owner um, exposed. So tell me, um, as we've got here now, so we've got a, a nice little team now and you're uh, kind of going through that transitional phase of um, stepping back, if you like, from patient care. We're trying to make the business less dependent upon you. What's some of the big decisions that you've had to make to get to this point? Yeah, I mean, every hire, I think, was a big decision originally. So my first admin hire um, was a big decision. You know, I, I just read a post the other day and I posted it in Facebook for it, in the Facebook group for another member um, about it's just so funny how you you hold yourself back so much. Every decision that you decide, like that seems so big is is really not and can be changed in an instant. You can flip if it doesn't work, you can just flip that switch right off. And so uh, but it's hard to take the risk. I think it, when you're an individual looking at the situation to take a risk, it's hard. It just is too close to you. And that's where a group like Mastermind and CEO is so valuable because you're seeing these other people make these decisions really quickly. And if they go wrong, it's no problem because you, they're just lessons. They're just lessons to help you keep building. So I think those first hires were definitely the hardest. My admin is still with me and it's 
she's my biggest point of failure right now because I just hired, you know, fired that salesperson again. But um, it is what it is. So <laughs> looking to de-risk her position as soon as possible. And then um, my my first PT hire was also a, you know, a big risk. Also, I gave her a big fat salary and that was that was scary and hard. Yeah. Uh, it also, it didn't work out. And thank goodness I had CEO to show me that, <laughs> to show me that, the that it was. Her the doll. Is this the one we yeah. showed the doll to? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm sure Is we'll get in. Is the one that you were adamant that you were going to keep that we kind of. Yeah, yeah. And I think someone said like. From nearly 3,000 miles away that yeah. may not have been the right one to keep. Yeah. Right. I think if you ever have to write out this big emotional letter or piece to like get your feelings out about an employee, they're 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 gone. <laughs> well, I've learned a long time ago from over probably a hundred staff now in two different countries. It's no different. Your um whatever your fit whatever your gut instinct feeling is about somebody, and this is in life, by the way, very rarely are you wrong. Very rare. There's always a, there's always exceptions. There's always exceptions, but whatever your gut feeling is very rare do you do you ever get it wrong particularly after 60 90 days it's like yeah that's that 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 pattern if you like that you started to kind of have doubts about or that emerged and you began to feel a little um not happy with shall we say um you're very rarely wrong but there's a couple of things i want to point out i don't know if you remember back at the start of ceo when when we started the ceo mastermind i always start with jahari's window you remember where i draw on the board I'm sure I've done it with your group. And ultimately, that everybody in life, and particularly in business, you play in four quadrants. You play in one of four quadrants. And one of them is the current field that you're playing on. Um, another quadrant is what's called the mask, where it's like you you are hiding something from us. Another one is a blind spot that you can't see. So that day that we were telling you to come on, like this is time to, to, to move this person on, shall we um, say politely, um, it's time for this person to leave that's called a blind spot you you can't see that but we all can so we can see something that you can't the other field that you play on the fourth quadrant is the future right the future is unknown and ultimately what you want to get to in business is to play more into the future where if you keep playing today you'll always get what you've always got right that's why most businesses stay stuck because they play on today's field they make decisions that they're comfortable with they pay the, the salaries that they're comfortable with, they hire the type of people that they're comfortable with. It's why a PT never hires a marketing or salesperson, right? Candidly, you would never have hired a salesperson in a million years had you not been around people who were telling you to hire a salesperson. What you would have done is kept hiring an operation, a, a, a PT after PT after PT, and you would have been looking for a PT to bring their own client base with them or, you know, chase referrals from doctors. But really where all your growth comes from is the future. And, and that's where, back to your point, is the hiring decisions are uh, big and they're um, uncomfortable because you've never made them before. And the result, the reason that it's so scary is the result is in the future. And the business owner that learns to play in the future, where the new playing, so we basically got to make the future's playing field like today's. And then the minute that today's playing field becomes comfortable, we kind of need a new playing field. We need to hire bigger. We need to invest in a bigger premise. Do you get it? So yeah. you're constantly, as a business owner, having to overcome. And by the way, it never goes away. It never, ever, ever stops being scary. It never, ever feels comfortable hiring anybody at any price, at any salary. Never gets any easier because it's not the the, the actual uh, hire that you're, you're uncomfortable with. It's the fact that the value of the hire is in the future, and we can't see that today. But that's what a growth mindset business owner um ultimately has to be able to um to do so what else tell me other uh, around hiring some big lessons some big lessons that you've learned on your on your journey how many hours a week now are you are you treating right now would you say i currently treat three days a week so, so we're trying to get what, what's the goal when so then in january we're down to two days a week and starting in march i'll be at one day a week great so so, so what's the lessons you've gone from um 40 hours a week fully clinical answering the phone open up practice recruiting hiring scorecard pretty much everything uh running your team back there what's the lessons you've learned on getting to the point now where you're almost down to one day a week yeah um always recruiting i think that's the biggest lesson like having someone ready to fill a position yeah. uh my second pt hire was much easier to make uh it was quick and you know i was it became more comfortable. It was in, I knew what the value was going to be. So that had already played out for me. Um, 
where, where what was the beginning of this question, Paul? Uh, biggest lessons learned. Biggest lessons biggest learned. Lessons learned. So we, 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 you're growing yeah. a profitable practice. Yeah, and I think so the other the point of one day. So how because because people listening to this are going okay, great, right? You, normally, I have listeners or watchers or followers uh, who are in one of two camps. I have a business and it's profitable, mm-hmm. but I'm a slave to it figuratively, and it's I'm working 40, 50 hours a week, and I'm seeing all the patients, and this thing's not going to grow anymore because they're just busy in the in the treatment room, or they're trying they're trying to grow, they're trying to get to a point where they can they can recruit staff, but ultimately most people want to get to where you're just about there where mm-hmm. there may be some clinical care because that's what you love and you want to keep a day in if you like um for treating patients but you're getting to the point where you'll have four days a week that you can decide you can either be with the kids at home you can be in the office you can work wherever you want to make the decisions to grow this business or grow your lifestyle yeah. how, how what how have we got there and what's the lessons so there's like big decisions that you've had to make and think that you've learned along the way that we're trying to share with somebody yeah i think Well, the hiring was the big thing, but the next biggest lesson and and really what I went into 2020 with was like, I I told myself that I would, the biggest thing I needed to grow personally this year was to truly learn how to become a coach, learn how to truly train and lead my people. And in order to do that, I guess I had to figure out what that means because I kind of, I, I get away with people just buying into me and buying my energy from the beginning, but that only lasts for, you know, energy, it doesn't, doesn't last forever. And that stuff also doesn't keep people bought in forever. Yeah. So, so is this, the, is this your staff, you mean, not your patients. So this is your staff. I'm staff. Yeah. I'm talking yeah. staff. And so I had to figure out that I can't be friends with everyone. I think I was trying, I, you know, that was the big mistake, right? Yeah. You, you hire people you, you like and that you vibe and that you want to be friends with or not friends with, but you think they'd be, yeah. you know, they fit the mold in that way. And so having those boundaries was a big lesson of 2020 good. and, and that, um, yeah. So, so that was, that's a good lesson for me and Can really coaching then let's stay there. I'd like to know more about this. Tell me more about what it takes. What 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 does it mean to you to be a coach? Yeah, so I think teaching. So my practice is also very specific in the fact of like how we treat and like everyone has to learn the techniques and that takes a couple months to learn before you can start treating patients. And yeah. so that that alone like to be able to teach that but still, you know, you're teaching another professional, another doctor, and so you have to have this level of respect as well um uh so it was it was just it was a a point at which i just had i had to learn how to do it but what made this easy for me and truly helped a ton is scorecards so creating you know accountability on top of the teaching So the teaching is one thing. The teaching of the skills is one thing. Teaching of conversations is another. But then teaching, like just basing all the lessons off scorecard as well is extremely beneficial and helpful for everyone. And then we know where to focus for the for the week. There's a point with um, there's a point with coaching that I think is a little understood that really I I, like let's let's because everybody worries right that. Uh, as you start to coach your team, that you may not be clinically as skilled as somebody that you're trying to teach, right? And you are worried that you are being judged by your potential cohort for teaching them something that they don't think is the right way to do it, right? So it, that's what puts a lot of people off from ever coaching. But here's the analogy that I was given when it came to coaching. Imagine being Tiger Woods coach. How could you possibly coach Tiger Woods to be better at, at this thing, right? How, how could how could anybody have the audacity to sit and stand next to a man who is like arguably in his prime, the greatest ever golfer, and tell him how to hit a golf ball better, right? Imagine what what humility it must take for Woods to be able to turn around and actually listen to somebody who's never won it because most of these coaches have never won a tournament, they've never won a trophy. They've never made any money out of golf, right? Other than out of coaching. And when I understood that, I realized that really what the, 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 the nuances of coaching aren't always about 
the technical aspect of the thing that you're doing. Tiger Woods knows how to hit a golf ball. I'm, I'm pretty sure at this point, Tiger Woods knows how to hit a golf ball. What he can spot is the obvious things that he's not doing as well as he could. So nearly always with a coach, 80% of what you're doing isn't necessarily to make them better. It's just to make sure that what they're capable of, they're actually doing. That's what a coach does. And I remember watching a documentary on Jose Mourinho, the, the, one of the great soccer managers. Uh, he's won tournaments and trophies all over the world. And somebody asked him that question. They said, how do you make, how do you make um, Ronaldo, the greatest ever player who he coached, how do you make him better? He said, I can't. I can't make him better. How could I possibly make Ronaldo? Ronaldo makes Ronaldo better. He says, all I can ever do is make him play better in my team. And I thought that was such a profound um, understanding of what we're doing as business owners. And if you've seen over the years, soccer and NFL and baseball and um, any kind of sports franchise, when I was a kid growing up, it was the manager and now it's the coach. Over the last 10, 15, 20 years, they've moved from being the football manager or the soccer manager to the soccer coach because that, I think, is more accurate as to what they actually are. They're, they're developing their people. And the, the difference in coaching really comes down to, as I brought here, there's two things you're looking for in coaching. And anybody listening who's involved in people and managing people and developing people, you're only ever going to grow your company if you grow your people. There's two things you're looking at with scorecards to remember. How to do it is one thing. Did they actually do it is another, right? So it isn't really always about teaching me something new. It's actually just confirmed that what I was supposed to do, I did. And 80% of the improvement in team comes from, did you actually do it? And, and the majority of the time, staff don't even realize that they haven't done what they're asked to do. And they'll often tell you that. Good, good member of staff will say, oh, shit, I didn't even realize I'd gone off track here. And that's the point of the scorecard conversations is to bring somebody back onto a track that you created that all things being equal if you can get somebody on a path on a track with a roadmap if you like to, to go where you have set the destination to be if you just keep them on that track they'll be good enough to do their job and your job as the coach of that team is just to keep correcting them so what else Thanks. what are the what are the lessons that you learned in yeah um, to where you are today yeah i think the lessons are also have a really good have a good vision and a good mission, you know, that you full heartedly believe and that yeah. will help you attract the right staff. And, and really that will help keep people on the track trajectory, you know, of. You've got a great energy and, and you have every, every time I'm around you, I speak to you or um, even answer questions or talk to you on the coaching calls. You've got a great energy. Where does that come from, from you? <sighs> yeah, it's innate. No, I don't know. I, 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 you've asked me that before, Paul, and I don't know what to say. It's a trick I never question. Know how to I, I know where it comes. I know where it comes from. So it's a, it's a, okay. it's a trick. It's a trick question. It comes because you, you've, you just answered it. You're so clear on what you want. You okay. are clear on what you want to achieve, right? And and the energy that you get because you have a clarity of purpose, um, means that you get up every day, determined to do the things that you need to do to get done what has to happen in order to achieve your your ultimate outcome whereas what most people are doing absent of clarity which 99 percent of business owners don't and can't see what they want that they'll give you some arbitrary i want to make money or i want to make a hundred thousand dollars right that's not really like the big vision of what that won't keep me motivated enough to get through the, the, the days to get up with purpose and to get up with energy. But when I can start to see over the top of my life over the next five or 10 years and what I want and who I want to impact and the example I want to set for my kids and how I want people to perceive me and how I want to perceive myself and what my vision is for this bigger entity that I'm trying to create and all the lives I'm trying to impact. When you get crystal clear on that, it's very easy to overcome the shit that you have to deal with when you're building a business. And it's that shit that people deal with. Give it a year or give it two years. Eventually, there's enough setback, enough setbacks that knocks them out of their stride, knocks them off their, their their rhythm, loses their energy. It starts to become struggle, not effort. Remember, I've said this before. The difference between struggle and effort is negative energy. And negative energy turns something that you and I will both look at as a challenge and think, great, let's nail this. Great, come on, I've got to find another sales development person. Great, right, let's get this done. Whereas somebody else, it's like, oh, shit, I have to go through all this again and I can't stand recruitment because it's struggle. That's struggle now. But we're both doing the exact same thing. 
but because you and I are clear on our visions, that shows up as energy. And ultimately, you're doing something that energizes you. Yeah. And that's that's the fountain of youth. If, if if I'm if I'm pushed, that's that's the eternal, you know, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom or whatever it is. That's the fountain of youth that we're all trying to get to. It, it you know the the monetary aspect of things in business is one thing, but to wake up every day and have an energy about you and come to work and want to knock over obstacles and and take shit and flack and hassle and crap and deal with COVID and asshole governors and governments and people who are fucking dumb but running <laughs> running entire bloody nations and states you're thinking oh my god you're like you, you need a you need an energy to be able to uh to, to see past all of those things and i think that's where you get i think that's where you get yours from because you know what you want to do and you know who you want to impact thank you yeah what about your life tell me some lessons you've learned about how the how the business journey's impacted your life and um, don't get too too deep but just yeah, enough to, uh, i won't go deep i'll, I'll stay <laughs> just, i'll stay just, light just um, enough to give us some insights on how allison has developed as a person mother friend you know yeah whatever. from a tactical level it's funny uh at our annual planning event our the woman i just let go she she said you know why don't you start marketing to like this group of people uh, it was like pre-menopause and menopause. It was, it, it was interesting. And so it made me reflect. That was a superficial thing to say, like my business, 120% reflects my life uh, right now and really has over the last three years since I've started it. And so it just, it also like, it gives me insight into the future of like where I'll go is it, this will just like continue to be the reflection of my life. And, you know, from, a, from marketing to, you know, innovating different marketing strategies and things like that. It really does just 100% reflect where I'm at, um, which is interesting to say. So on a business level, that that is, that, yeah. So I think I said that. But from a personal level, um, I would say, you know, it's, it's hard to turn off. It's hard to turn off your, your constant thought process of growing the business, all the moves you want to make. Um, so how do you do maybe, that with, how, how do you, how do you, um, how do you play the role, right? How do you play the role of, of wife, of mother, of business owner, of somebody whose thoughts are preoccupied with business? And I've no doubt you're like every other parent who runs a business where your, you know, your thoughts are wrestling between you should be thinking about your kids more and you should be doing things more at home. And yet you're kind of secretly thinking about your business and it's like, you know, you, you, yeah. you we're trying to wrestle these things all day. How do you, how do you do that? Yeah. I think you've helped me be comfortable with that's okay. You know, to just be like, okay with it. Um, I spend a lot of time with my kids too. So yeah. I, you know, I get to pick them up every day at four o'clock or before four o'clock and, uh, you know, and you, you engineered your business from day one to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, previously I did have one night per week that I was working till seven, but it was a good night for my husband to take on full responsibility of yeah. <laughs> bath time, dinner, all, you know, bedtime, everything. So I kind of miss those nights actually. Um, uh, you but, know what, again, it's, it's, it's interesting how, um, you say these things, you know, you say that and yeah. uh, Natalie will often say to me, she'd be like, Oh, I, I'm going out on Wednesday. And she's, you know, she'll kind of be like ca cautiously kind of, not that there's ever any need, but you know, so she's like, oh, I'm just going out on, on Thursday with the girls. I'm like, she, oh, all right, you haven't got anything. I'm like, no, go, please go, like, go and do whatever you want. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I'll be back in at 10. I'm like, no need to tell me, come in whenever you want. Don't worry. If the, if I know you're coming in at 10, then boys will be up till 9 58, right? So don't tell me what time you're coming in. And it's kind of like that, right? Yeah. And then, yeah. And then she comes in and it's like 10 15. Or if she's like, what time did the bus go to bed? I'm like, oh, they've been in bed an hour, you know, hour and a half, like, like, we've barely been in bed like three minutes, you know? Yeah. But it's one of the best nights, like, and it's great. And and I, I think you know you've got to you've got to have those uh, you've got to have those moments in your week where things are broken up. And it, you know, even if you miss a few games, you know, you miss the weekend or the soccer. It's like, all right, that's not going to be here every week. Get used to it. And that's like that's what I you know said to Harry one one weekend. He's like, oh, dad, you're not going to be. I'm like, no, I won't be there every weekend. I can't be there every weekend. Like, get used to it. Start like, yeah. start accepting and and understanding that this is the way you know this is the way it is. But I love coming back next week when I get when. I get a chance to 100%. uh to watch you yeah so and, I, and in complete reality that's where like mastermind and ceo it's a good it's a good little shock way for the whole family to like get on without me a little bit you know yeah. so because i am really the primary caregiver you know in my family and household because yeah. i'm the mom right so yeah. um which i love you know but that's where it's like these 
these little breaks are great too. So, you know, it's like little vacations for me. Yeah. Not, what's, you know, what's, what's the drive for you then other than the vision? What's like, what's underneath it? What's, yeah. what's, what drives you on? <laughs> these are hard questions, Paul. Uh, so I, I don't know. other than like my yacht that's waiting for me, the yacht, the Lambo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I definitely want to have a little bit of... Can you get yachts in Seattle or is it just rain oh, all the time? I thought it just... Oh, no, yeah. Yeah, I'll... I didn't realize like, it was sunny enough to have a have a, a yacht over there. Absolutely. All we right. have a whole marine marine okay. lifestyle here. Does it ever get sunny or just... <laughs> the yeah, we, we've had a week of sunshine, but yeah, yeah. It's... Well, we, we had our winter this 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 week in Orlando. We had two oh. days of, of uh, 45 degrees and that's it. It's gone now. So, yeah. so what are we into? Spring now? We're back? We're kind of passed into spring now. <laughs> so what's the drive? Uh, uh, yeah. So apart from the yacht. So beyond like the mission and the vision, I, yeah, I mean, drive is a characteristic, right? So you're asking me to explain where the motivation yeah. like, is. What, what's the thing that's like, all right, this gets me out of bed. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to achieve. This is what I want to prove. This is what I want to become. Like, yeah, is- yeah, I, I think, I mean, I am so driven and I think it has to do with like, I'm in constant competition with myself to, to grow, to be better, to I like beyond this, I want to have another location or a few, you know, more across the nation. I'd love to, you know, expand in that way. But I also have this desire to not be a liability in the business whatsoever and to be able to be out on a, on our boat with the kids and my husband for a week or two at a time, you know? So, so I don't, um, I guess the drive is, you know, the lifestyle, but I'm also really enjoying our current lifestyle. And even if you gave me $30 million, I actually wouldn't change anything. You know, it would maybe allow me to be a little bit riskier in how I operate the business and, you know, grow it a little quicker. But other than that, I like, I'm pretty content with where life is. And I don't think it would even change with that huge lump sum of money. So. So, So it's very internal. Yeah. Yeah. You tend to find that that the people who are the most fulfilled, if you like, in business, certainly the people I've I've hung around with, there's a notion, there's a notion um, that you that as you grow up, you're trying to prove something to somebody, and I often see business owners who are um, trying to prove somebody something to a parent or to a school teacher or some somebody random that just kind of pissed them off when they were a kid uh, or didn't believe in them, and it's like, oh, I'm going to show you, or I'll you know I'll show my husband, or I'll show my wife, or I'll show my parents, and it's like. Those are the ones that you find often can be successful, but they don't enjoy it. Um, and I think the latter is equally as important, which I've always said. It's not just about making a lot of money. Uh, making money is really, really easy. Uh, the real skill is can you do it and enjoy the journey? Can you get to the point? There's a great book I read recently by um, Phil Knight of Shoot, uh, from, from Nike. And he said it right at the end. He, it's The whole book's about adversity and how he overcome years of just hassling crap and people kicking him and whatever, you know, basically. And right at the end, he says, my only regret is I, I, I won't get to do it all again. And I just thought, oh, that's so so amazing, you know, that it was never actually about achieving anything, really. It wasn't about, like, you know, making whatever he is, $4 billion, you know, net worth. Um, it was actually about um, something that I wanted to do, Um and because of that, I enjoyed the journey. And it wasn't about just proving to somebody or a person that I'm capable of doing something. And I, I think that that's where the, certainly when I see business owners that are stressed and tired and not happy, no matter how much money they make, there's nearly always an intrinsic need to prove something, somebody something. And no matter what they achieve, the person that they're trying to prove it to doesn't give a shit. But when you're on the internal crusade and it becomes you against you, and you're trying to beat yourself every day, um, that's a different level of competition. You're almost unstoppable when it becomes, um, when it just becomes about you trying to be better than the standards that you had yesterday. Tell me about some leadership lessons. Yeah. Uh, I mean, COVID was a big test. COVID was a huge test. Yeah, tell me, how did you get through that? Yeah, so that's when I lost my my first PT. Um, But it was a good, it was good because it brought everyone's true colors out real quick, right? So it 
that was excellent. It allowed me to see those and take, make decisions to, to change course. Um, but it also, I think it made me, it, uh, it showed me how important it is to weed out emotion from the situation, you know? So how did you deal with your own emotion then through COVID as a leader? Yeah. What did you do? Because by the way, people are listening to this right now, yeah. still dealing with their own emotions because of COVID, like 99% of the United States of America and Britain and the rest and well, like, how do you, how do you deal with your own emotions throughout all yeah. that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I had stopped watching the news before COVID, but when that all started to happen, you know, it turned back on a little bit in my life and that just was a downward spiral. So yeah. shutting that back off and then really like, taking it out of the vocabulary with my patients, you know, not letting that be a part of what happens in here, taking it out of my personal life with my family, like not, you know, not really speaking of it. Um, Cause it's so all consuming, you know, and it's like obviously a massive important global event that we should be cautious of, yeah. but it doesn't mean that you have to change and like stop your, your life, stop helping people. Like yeah. people are all of my patients. Um, you know, everyone that comes here has gotten so every everyone's been affected by losing their routine. Yeah. And when you lose your routine, you lose your your everything. Like that's your mojo. That's how you feel good. Right. And yeah. um, and so I think that's the one thing that we've been able to ha be for people during this whole COVID thing is is routine um, and, uh, you know, support a new routine of coming here or, you know, helping them stay on their routine themselves. Um, but where was that? Where was that all coming from? Oh, how did I get through it? Leadership, yeah. So, what yeah. Did you, so lessons on leadership through COVID. Yeah. How did you? How did you manage your own emotions? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was it was definitely tough at first. We did shut down for a few weeks um, to get you know when we we didn't know what to do. And once we got some PPE, I got rid of the wrong employee. Um, Devin was still on my team, yeah. and we just hunkered down and we're like, we're this is still going to be a great year. We had hoped to be at 550k revenue this year. We are. I I guess I didn't really adjust my goal because I I don't like to adjust those goals. Um, so that was we're not quite going to get there, but we're hoping to get to so that 400. Was the goal for, I, that was the goal for yeah. for 2020. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we're gonna we're gonna miss it by maybe 150k. Yeah. Um, so that is. Uh, that's where we're at. We're, we're like shooting for that 400 mark at the moment um, in December, only being a couple of weeks left. But uh, yeah, so I guess it was, you know, we, we always had that goal, even through COVID, even through losing our employee, got another great PT in, but it, it took a couple months to train her. So, uh, but she was, she was bought in and she wasn't bothered by COVID. Like it was just so perfect. And it was a great, you know, great person to bring into the team um yeah so then from if you want me to keep going from here well yeah no i think it's great and what what i would say uh for me through covid the biggest the biggest lesson that that i'll probably take from it um from a leadership point of view but more than anything it absolutely confirmed to me this that i i've knew for a long time and it takes incidents like this to to remind you um big big events in your life don't change people they just accelerate who they already are right and they don't change businesses they just accelerated what it already was they don't change leaders they just accelerate who they are and i, and I always remember um you know people talk about uh, years and years ago like just family conversations about somebody came into money in the family or he's changed well not really he's already a dick like he's just now a bigger dick because he's got money like come on right let's face it right he's not he's always been whatever or he was arrogant. Well, he's just more arrogant, right? Because he's got money. Like it just it, it he hasn't become this person. He already was. He's just like ten times worse now. And and that's true of everything. That life events don't change people. They they nine out of ten times exacerbate who the person is. And as a leader, you found somebody who um, either um, crawled under a rock and is still, by the way, waiting for this to go away. We've watched this over six months. The people in our community have rose to the occasion and and sawed, and you've seen it. Right now, you can barely get people on a two-hour webinar for free, right? It's it's like they, they, they're that dead. They're that beat. They won't attend a webinar. They don't open email. They don't respond to your mail anymore. 
this time last year you'd do a webinar a thousand people had registered however many turn up like two weeks ago it's probably half what it what it was right they're just they're just beat like they're just waiting for this whole thing to go away but it reveals who they are anyway right but you know in our world sales haven't changed the customers are still as good because we're just getting the cream of the crop but what you're getting is an obvious shift in um the people that are the, the best business owners and the best leaders are soaring and flying and the business owners that were shitty and didn't do anything and never done anything are, are, are on hold right now and they're stuck and by the way it's the same with your team what you found through covid was that if you had good team they'll support you they'll back you they'll do anything for you they'll work whenever you want them to work they'll move heaven and earth with their kids they'll move heaven and earth with their time slots whatever if they were just there for a paycheck they, they went home, they switched off their phone. Every time they had a cough, they went home for another two weeks. Every time they sneezed, the whole building needed to shut down. Somebody fucking coughed in the toilet two weeks ago and everybody has to close down and like ET's fucking, you know, infection control comes in and cleans the whole fucking place out. It's like, come on, do we, do we really need to go there? But that's life and that's where people are and that's what you'll find with your business. It's been a wonderful year to be um, what Anil uh, taught me back in March and April when we were doing those calls, uh, to be an observer. It's been a wonderful year to step back and just observe everybody around you, friends, your family, your staff, yourself, your family, like er anybody. There's so many good things to have learned from what's gone on in the last um, in the last few months. And I, I say it many times, any business owner that's still got business owner in their title right now they should be very proud of themselves to make it uh to make it through what is arguably going to be the biggest challenge or setback you'll ever have as a as a business owner so last question what's next yeah um so i i hired another pt she starts in january yeah. so she'll be training january february we'll start her caseload in march yeah um i need to replace that sdr briefly. So I, I might hold tight with that for a little bit and just, uh, you know, we're, we're still interviewing. Uh, but I, I can, with my two days a week, fill that role a little bit. Yeah. So I might, I might step into that right now just to unload Devin a little bit. We, uh, we launched an online program in like two days. So that's been a little crazy here. Good. We, we never stop moving. Devin embraces the chaos with me and yeah. It's what about good. beyond that? What's where, where do you see this going? Yeah, so I'll be stepping out of patient care in July. And then um, from there, I am hoping to move this location into a little bit bigger of a location and expand our services. Yeah. And then once we go, once that all happens, then we'll be able to um, multiply locations. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm very excited to watch. And, um, uh, privileged is probably the right way to be uh, in the in the uh, call pilot. Well, I'm not going to say the call pilot seat, but certainly a seat where I get to, uh, to watch this uh, to watch this journey continue, both professionally and uh, personally. But I've I've admired you, and I've just loved you since day one. And um, I am attracted to business owners with the same um, enthusiasm and energy uh for life and uh for business and basically being able to just just fucking get on with it whatever the deal is with kids whether it's business whether it's covid just get on right just just no no dramas let's just crack on and um that's one of the things i've where where did i first put you on stage was it in vegas did i put you on stage and was it last vegas so. you, yeah you, you got on the stage in las vegas yeah and i put you i put you on the spot and i said i remember i said oh, yes. everybody needs a bit of allison in their life <laughs> everybody needs somebody like allison in their life that's what i said exactly what i said and i meant that in the in the loveliest possible way with energy and enthusiasm and your outlook on life it's a credit to you it's a credit to your family your business um your team and your people and everything that you're doing and um you'll be an inspiration and, and are an inspiration to uh, to certainly people in our community and uh, no doubt now thousands of people who are listening to this podcast. So well done. Lovely. Thank you so much, Paul. Where, where can people find uh, your Facebook and Instagram? Can they uh, just follow yeah. you a little? Body Motion PT on Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest. And um, yeah. And then bodymotionpt.com for our website. Wonderful. Alison, thank you. Cool. I look forward to uh, hopefully hopefully seeing you here in uh, a very sunny Orlando in, in February for CEO. Yes. Yes. Me All too. Right. Thanks for your time. Appreciate <laughs> Thank you. you. Thanks, Alison. See you. Bye-bye.